I will just uh, introduce uh, Véronique. First, I want to thank uh, Véronique because she came from, uh, from San Francisco all uh, the way to, to, to talk with us. And I want to thank, to take the opportunity to, to thank Elodie who organized the trip and also the training unit for communicating uh, around uh, this uh, presentation. So Véronique did her PhD at the Université Libre de Bruxelles in Belgium. And uh, she then uh, performed a postdoc in molecular biology uh, at the University of California in San Francisco. She joined, uh, after a postdoc, she joined a biotech and uh, she participated in the development of vector for gene uh, therapy. And then uh, she moved on and uh, became editor in chief for Nature Methods, I think when it was created, mm -hmm. when Nature Methods were created. And uh, she became uh, executive e um, editor for the Nature Publishing Group, uh, where she oversaw Nature Journal Research Integrity and editorial policies. And since last summer, uh, she became executive editor, uh, no, chief editor. No, no, executive, no. executive editor, excuse me. <laughs> For the, uh, for the non-profit uh, PLOS uh, publishing group, and she's still very involved uh, in research uh, integrity. So she will present today her personal perspective on the issues surrounding reproducibility and responsible publication. Again, I want to thank you, Veronique. Thank you. <laughs> and thanks, Claire. Can, can you hear me okay at the back? Yes? Um, so I, I have a, a question. Um, so um, thank you for the kind uh, introduction and for the kind invitation. It's really, um, it's a privilege to be here and I'm delighted to see that there are so many people uh, here and I understand in another slide who are uh, very in interested in, in research integrity. So um, as Claire said, I'm a, I'm, I'm a scientist by training um, and I've been an editor uh, for the past 12 years. So the perspective I'm going to give you is the perspective of, of an editor. Um, you probably have a very different perspective, uh, and I, I know that in your mind you'll go, well, yes, but in the lab it's different as I'm talking. And, so, and that's fine, because I think that's, that's exactly where, uh, there where we need to converge at the end, and, and hopefully we'll have time for questions. Um, but also what I want to stress is that I'm, even though I'm speaking as, a, as an editor, I want to stress that for me, I as an editor, I find it very important that the paper is not the end product. The end product is the research that you are sharing with the rest of the scientific community, and it's basically that paper that is being used by the rest of the scientific community to advance knowledge and research. And so this is really why I talked about, um, you know, from bench to paper and beyond, because really it's the beyond that is very important in, in what we are doing. Um, so the, the context of uh, uh, what I'm going to talk about um, is, yes, wonderful. Um, so the context is this. So when this is on the cover of The Economist, as it was uh, in October 2013, we all have a problem. Right? Uh, we as editors and journals have a problem because, uh, because we are publishing the science that is deemed wrong. Um, you as scientists have a problem because this means that the public opinion of science is eroding and that is very difficult. And, and funders have a problem because they're using public money to fund research and they have to justify this kind of thing. So this is really the context of what we're talking about. It's about making sure that the research that, that, that we are doing, that you are doing, is being used and is being reproduced and is being really effective at, at what it is. And so um, since, I mean, this arrived in, in, in 2013, um, I started becoming involved in, in conversation around reproducibility in 2012. Obviously, it's not a new problem. It existed before that. But it sort of um, started getting into its, its own in 2012. And um, when we talk about, um, about these issues of reproducibility and so on, um, these terms are, are being used a lot, um, research integrity. And when people talk about research integrity, very often we start talking about scientific misconduct about ethics, and then there is this term, res responsible conduct of research. Um, so research integrity, I mean, scientific misconduct, in fact, has a very narrow definition. 
it's a legal term. It's something that you can um, go to jail for if you, if you commit it, uh, at least in the US. Uh, there is a very uh, narrow definition of it, which according uh, in the US, the, the definition at the federal level is that it's fabrication, falsification, or plagiarism with an intention to deceive. So it has to be intentional. Um, so that's quite narrow, and there aren't, in fact, that many cases that are proven scientific misconduct, right? Um, similarly, ethics is incredibly important in the biomedical sciences. Uh, it's, it's absolutely incredible import incredibly important. But if you think about it, um, cases of, of demonstrated research misconduct, uh, breaches of ethics, it's that. It's the top of the iceberg, right? The problem really is, I mean, this is a problem and it's something we need to, add, but it's a very small proportion of the cases. The vast majority of problems occur um, when research is not really reproducible. It's the gray zone. It's the thing that is not really demonstrated misconduct, but it's a, gr it's a gray zone. And that's what we have to be very, very careful about. This is what leads to this, this issue, um, uh, this, this public perception that science is not reliable. Um, and this is what leads to these kinds of research. So it's not just The Economist, right? These are uh, three papers that really sort of um, catalyzed a lot of this discussion in the field. The first one was in PLOS Medicine as early as 2005 uh, by uh, John Ioannidis, who basically um, explains why statistically a lot of the things that are published in the, in the scientific literature are false positive. They're actually not, not true observations. And, and that has to do about the way we are doing research in general. And I think that's, that's very important to keep in mind. The other two papers were interestingly papers written by um, the pharma industry um, and indicating that uh, pharma cannot use the published literature as a solid and, and, and trusted base to develop uh, drugs. So, so this really catalyzed the whole, um, a whole debate. And I want to spend a little bit of time um, I, I want to do two things in this talk. The first one is go a little bit under, uh, in, uh, under the hood and look at the problems who lead to these kinds of, uh, of issues. Um, and then, uh, because I'm an optimist, I want to go into thinking about this as an opportunity and really seeing what we can do both from the journal's perspective, from the researcher's perspective, what are the things that we should start thinking about to address these issues. Um, when I'm going to talk about the problem, I'm going to go and, 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 and cite some very specific kinds of issues that, that um, have been at the basis of that, uh, that have been over the years, we've really sort of unpacked this problem and there are a lot of, uh, of issues um, underlying that. Um, I do not want to sound patronizing, right? This is not the armchair editor telling you scientists do a better job, right? This is not what this is. Um, I'm sure I'm going to show examples and you will say, each of you, I would never do that. And I trust it. I know this is true. But you have to think that at the end of the day, this happens. The literature is full of these problems because people do it. And why do people do it? Because they're under tremendous pressure. The system we have now is putting tremendous pressure on the people. So you might never do it, but think about what a colleague, what a young scientist that you're training might do under pressure if they're not sensitized to these kinds of issues. And think about this when you're reviewing papers, because at the end of the day, that's why the, the, the literature is also a reflection of what we do as a community to, to filter that. So that, that's, that was just my word of caution. Let's talk about these issues. I mean, a lot of the issues are also coming from a very natural tendency that we all have um, about telling a good story. And that tendency is amplified by the current publishing system where people are really asked to publish a, a very strong story with very strong evidence, with very striking results. And that can lead to um, unconscious biases that we have to be very careful about. The famous representative experiment. We're all showing the representative experiment. We're all showing the best experiment, of course, in the papers. And then, but how, you know, this is three, three representation of a, it's a, it's a made up, um, <coughs> uh, but based on, right on, 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 on actual data, um, it's a made up story, but, you know, three different situations. I mean, yes, it's the same blood, but depending on which blood you show, you're actually telling a slightly different story. And even if it's not necessarily very deep <coughs> um, behind, not showing that variability behind the, um, uh, the story is, is actually part of how you tell the story. So it's important when you tell the story of saying, well, you know, we've done it 
three times, or we've done it 30 times. And this is the kind of variability we're seeing behind, or we've done it once, which happens sometimes as well, right? I mean, even when you, you um, take um, choices, when you, you, you make brackets, I mean, bar graphs, we talked about that this morning, and there are cases where bar graphs are good, but in most cases, bar graphs are a curse because they obscure the variability. So this is the same data set represented in a bar graph with a CM and representative as a uh, represented as a box plot. Well, obviously, this looks like it's much more variable than this, right? And if you don't have access to the data underneath it, this is the kind of issue. So, um, so the choices we make in telling a story are very important. And obviously, you want everybody to think it's that. But at the end of the day, we're scientists. We're working in complex systems. We have to think this way and acknowledge that that's the variability we have. Um, and then there's all the things that you can uh, that you uncover when you start playing with contrasting images and things like that. So if you think, at the, you know, this is again a real case. Um, you see this image, and if you start doing contrast adjustment, you see that these two nuclei here um, in this, uh, in this a fish experiment, I believe, um, the, the, you know, there's no background around these two cells. This is a bit fuzzy background, fuzzy background. There's no, there's very sharp edges there. What's, what's happening there? Well, you know, it's a case. We looked into it. This is what happened, right? These are actually three different frames taken at the microscope. And the experimentator just wanted to show more cells because what's important to the experimentators is the, is the green dots, right? And, and so, so let's show more of them so that we actually show a good representation. Let's, let's make the data tell a better story. So there is no intention to deceive here. It's the data. The data exists. It's there. Anything. But the problem is that's wrong. That's wrong. That's not the data. That's embellished data. And, and when that becomes okay, then all sorts of things become okay when you change the data. And that's the slippery slope that is, very, that is very difficult. And again, in this case, it's an example I like because it's really not coming from an intention to show something false. It's, in, it's, it's showing better data. And, and I think that's really a, a, a danger. Because when you start doing that, then you start doing that kind of thing. Right? So what does that mean? Who knows? Right? You really have, you, that, that, that becomes falsification. And so, so, so that's the, the slippery slope that we have to be, um, to be careful. Well, yeah, the outliers, uh, you know, obviously, everybody has been tempted to re remove the outliers. And then what does it do to the result at the end, right? And of course, there might be some reasons why these out are outliers. And you remember when you analyze the data that actually, you know, there was something funny when you run the experiment or whatever. Well, that's a problem, right? It's about, it's about ex we're, we're the rigorous way of doing things is really to, to basically predetermine inclusion and exclusion criteria. And reviewing papers is things, that, you know, you need to know and, we, and, and you need to report what were the exclusion criteria. It's fine to exclude data points in some cases if, if it's predetermined before doing the experiment. So it's, it's a lot about, it depends on what you tell around this story. The other thing, I mean, that, that's a fairly obvious example. And, but, but what if the data points fall out by themselves? And um, what I'm talking about here is the question of attrition in animal research. You know, the, when we start with eight mice at the beginning of the experiment and there are seven mice at the end of the experiment because something went wrong and an animal dropped out. Well, that paper, which was published in, in January in, pl in Plus Biology, did, a, did an analysis of reporting of attrition. And basically their conclusion, uh, having looked at, at 500 studies in the literature, is that attrition is actually not reported properly. And they did some simulation. It's actually a very good read. Um, they did some simulation um, uh, of what, what happens if, you know, if animals drop out um, completely randomly if it, or if there is something that is actually linked to the effect that you're measuring. And you're seeing different things. If the, if the, if the, the loss of animal is completely random, uh, you tend to see false negatives. If, if it's bias removal, you tend to see a lot of false positives. And because a lot of these animal studies are on small number, small n, uh, the, the effects can be actually very, very high. So, you know, that's the other thing we have to, and so acknowledging these attrition, this attrition in, in uh, that then can be used in meta-analyses, et cetera, is actually very important. It's very important to know. And the only reason that in the literature you can, you can demonstrate, you can see why it's because, you know, it starts with eight and it finishes with seven or six. 
and, and if you really read the paper, you realize that actually it's, you know, there is a drop code, but this is not taken care of in the analysis, and that's, that's very important. Um, I mean, obviously, uh, um, animals are, are, are extremely complex systems, right? And, and this is, um, and this is, th this problem of reproducibility is also, in a way, a celebration of where we are in science. We are capable of studying very, I mean, we, you are capable of studying very, very um, complex systems. That is a celebration in itself. The fact that we can actually study things in animals is actually a very, uh, a very um, a thing to celebrate. At the same time, we have to realize that it is a, it, these are very noisy systems. That these are things that have a lot of parameters that we don't that we don't control. And obviously, that's why there are means of of controlling and and um, uh, you know, especially in animal research, randomization and blinding are really um, uh, things that are known to to control for the bias that that the experimental bias that can be introduced. Um, by really unconsciously, again, this is really, this is a natural thing. It's very unconscious, but it exists, and there are ways to control for it. Um, and why is it important to control for randomization or uh, by randomization and blinding? This is a study of nine publications, 29 experiments, doing the same things, looking at one, uh, it's a study by uh, Malcolm McLeod, and um, it's, um, it's, it's the effect of one um, uh, uh, drug on, on animal stroke models. And you see that the size of the effect, so this, is, this reports the size of the effect seen uh, as a percentage of improvement over, um, over the control. And you see that the size of effect is very, very different if you randomize the experiment or not. If you blind the, the animals to allocation treatment or control, or if you blind during assessment. So the size of effect is very, so this is just a demonstration that it's actually very important to do these blinding and, and, and and this led um, this group to, um, uh, um, and this is, um, as, as part of this discussion around reproducibility, animal research has been a very strong um, um, focus. And, and the uh, National Institute of, of Neurological Disease and Stroke organized a meeting in June uh, 2012 in the US where they really discussed these issues. And they, they came up with recommendations about improving the transparency of, of animals because they need to, you need to know, and it's not always possible to randomize. It's not only always possible, but really understanding um, whether it was done or not is very important. And so this was a call for, for, for reporting uh, and it became called a story. Then this was the, um, the head of the NINDS at the time. It's, it's become uh, known as in, in, the, in the field as the Landis 4, randomization, blinding, um, predetermination of sample size and inclusion exclusion criteria. These are the four things that should be reported for all animal experiments. And uh, Mal Malcolm McLeod again um, did uh, an experiment published in 2015 in, in, in PLOS Biology um, where they actually looked, they, they, they looked this time at, at 146 publications of in vivo research and they showed that the, the, the prevalence of reporting remi remains very low. Randomization, just under 20%. Blinding a few percent, and nobody virtually reports how they predetermine the, sem the, s the sample size that is needed to measure the, op the, um, the effect. Um, and, and this is very difficult because a lot, there, there is a, 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 a conflation in a way in the literature between exploratory research, where you don't know what you're looking for, and hypothesis testing research, where you're really validating an effect. And at the moment, this tends to be um, a bit combined together. And, and we're, we're drawing conclusion as if it was validation of science, which is actually exploratory. And really making the difference between that and really stating how the research was done is absolutely critical for people to understand whether, um, whether it is um, how it was done and, and, and what value to give to the research. Again, it doesn't mean that the research is not, is not important. It doesn't mean that it's not valid. It means that it needs to be interpreted with a grain of salt. And that's the very important is to, to provide that grain of salt. Um, another thing about precise reporting, uh, you know, it's um, th this, this notion of, 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 of biological replication, you know, the, the precision in reporting, N equal four in an experiment. In, in how many papers, do, do, you know, try it. Um, look at the literature, in, in look at, at the, the figure legends of paper, N equal four. When can you tell for what? Right? So if you have an experiment like that, you know, mouse, you do a sample preparation and you do an assay, whatever. If it's four mice, 
Well, that's biological variability. If you use four, four sample prep from mole mice, well, that's the sample preparation variability. If it's four replicates, for a quadruplicate from one sample, well, that's your pipetting, right? So, so, so that's very different. And, and, and if you look, and it's, as long as it's transparent, it's fine because people can take their conclusion. But in most of the problem we have is that it's not even reported transparency, so you can't tell. And I think that's the big issue. So that's the first thing to, to really say. Oh, that was the other thing. I wanted to do a, a show of hands. Um, how many people here are bench scientists? Hmm. All right. Um, how many people are working with uh, cell lines? Okay. How many people are of those are, are aware of this database of cross-contaminated and misidentified cell lines? And, and how many people authenticate their cell lines in the lab once a year? Um, what this database, go visit iClack, you know, do uh, note, go take note of that. It's also available at DNCDI. Um, this database, in this database, there are 438 cell lines that are, that are known <coughs> to be misidentified. When I say known to be misidentified, is that they've been cross-contaminated early enough that is, there is no authentic stock of these cell lines existing in the world, right? No known stock. So anybody using these cell lines is actually using something else, usually HeLa. <laughs> and, and, and they continue to be used. So this is the scary part. So this is an example, a specific example, um, ECV304, it's, uh, it was uh, derived as a spontaneously transformed um, uh, endothelial cell line. In 19, it was used since, I think, 19, the 1990s. Um, in uh, 1999, it was actually identified to, be cross can to have been cross-contaminated early with T24, which is bladder, bladder cancer cells. Since 1999, it continued to be, to be, to be cited. EC so these are citations for ECV304. Um, and these are the citations that cite it as an endothelial, a, a normal endothelial cell line. So it continues. So, so this, is, this goes to 2008. Ten years after having been identified as being con cross-contaminated, it continues to be used like that. And so that is really a major issue that we have in, in the field. And obviously, it's not always a problem, right? If you're producing a virus and the cell that you're using to produce the virus it gives a good yield, you don't really care what it is. Right. But if you're showing something saying it's an endothelial cell line, well, you better know that it's an endothelial cell. So this is, this is the kind of issues we, we have. And then, and then, and then there is the big issue of, because all we've talked about is what we see in the literature. Well, there are some of that, which is the cherry picking, and there is some of that, which is the, uh, the file drawer problem. So basically what we have here is a massive problem of publication bias, right? We are publishing positive results positive stories, the negative findings are not being published, are not being pursued. And that is really um, a big issue. And that's a shared responsibility. That's the fault of the journal as, well, as much as the fault of the researchers, as much as the fault of the institutions who don't reward publishing negative results. So this is really a, a, a more systemic problem that we have um, that, that needs to be uh, identified. And then there is p-hacking. I mean, we can go on, but do you know p-hacking? The idea of, of basically, uh, you, do an an you, you start from a data set, you do an analysis, statistical analysis, and it doesn't quite give the, sec the statistically significant result that you want to give, then you do another one. And, if you, and then you continue until you do the test that gives you significance. That's p-hacking, which now apparently it's in the urban dictionary online. So um, uh, it was, it's a term that was coined by, uh, by Yuri Simonson at UPenn. So, uh, and and it, this analysis, again, looked at the, 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 the amount of it, and there is quite a bit of that in the literature. It is a form of cherry picking, in a way. Um, now, it's not all negative, right? And, and, and we have to keep hope. As I said, I'm an optimist. And if you see, um, if you take a field like uh, 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 the, the genome-wide association studies, for example, when they started uh, being published, you basically were doing analysis and then following specifically a certain uh, 
uh, candidate loci, and it was full of false positives. There were a lot of problems, there were, and this was really you know, people starting to deal with big data and starting to understand. And then the field really came together, started um, agreeing on, on thresholds of significance, started agreeing on, on what kind of statistical analyses needed to be done, and you've seen a transformation in, in the quality of GWAS studies. And this is an example, um, it's a slide I, I've borrowed from uh, Dan MacArthur at, at the Broad. Um, uh, in 2008, there was, a, and specifically in, in Crohn's disease, there was a, a, a paper published by Barrett et al., um, which showed, um, uh, so this is the number of loci uh, versus the year it was published in. This was all the, uh, you know, hypothesis driven. I think that this gene has an effect and I've, I follow that. And then this is the advent of big data. And this is really when you start having much more controlled um, analysis of, of, of these GWAS. Uh, 3,000 cases, um, uh, for uh, almost 5,000 control, and they find, um, you know, just about 30 um, uh, loci. Oops, sorry. Um, 2010, uh, you have uh, 6,000 um, uh, um, cases, 15,000 control. They find many more loci, uh, about 80. And then uh, in 2012, uh, we're going up to uh, 163 uh, loci, and, and, and we are in the, the 75,000 sample. That, of course, is being used because it's the, the collaboration and people are sharing samples, sharing data, and doing these analyses. And what's very interesting is that all the 32 that were published in 2008 are basically uh, recapitulated in the further study. So this is really where and you start fi finding more, so you become more sensitive, but you continue. So this is really a field that sort of got its act together and started doing much, much better. So there is really, there, there are ways um, by being more transparent and more controlled and more rigorous about what, what we're doing. So really, we have an opportunity. It's not that, I mean, we have a problem, but I think we really have a pr an opportunity. Um, and I want to talk about the opportunity in, um, in really thinking about that as a, as a, um, a shared, a, a joint responsibility, as, 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 you, as we were saying at, at the beginning. It's really, at the end of the day, it's the researchers, right? It's, it's, it's in your hands. But obviously, there are other big players here. The journals have a role to play. They have a responsibility, and they have a role to play. Um, but the institutions too, and when I say institutions, it's the funding agencies and it's the research institutes. It's Curie here, it's the universities. These are absolutely important players in there. And um, I want to, I mean, there are a lot of things that we can do. I want to speak specifically about three um, things that, are, that really um, are, uh, I think, are, are important for us to target as soon as possible. The first one is really to see, um, to, to talk about openness and see how we can um, uh, address some of the issues that we've seen in, in, in the previous part of the talk. And then these two, credit and, and acceleration of, of communication, these are really things that I think are more systemic problems that we need to address um, uh, at, at a systemic level, really thinking about all these partners together. Um, so talking about openness first. Um, I have to make a pitch for open access. I work for an open access publisher. I, I switched recently. Um, open access is absolutely important. Um, the fact that, and open access is not just being able to read. I mean, this is one thing, right? It's really, it, it's really important to start with, the ability for everybody to be able to read research that is uh, funded by public funds. That's a, a, a very important principle. <laughs> But it's more that open access is actually more than that. It's about unrestricted reuse. It's about the fact to use licenses like, like CCBY, which are really, which allow people to do text mining, data mining of that literature, to really start thinking about these meta-analyses, starting. And, and if all this literature is behind paywalls, these text mining are not possible. So this is really the importance of, of open access at the, at the macro level, really, is to open it not only for, for individuals to read, but for machine to read and to, to really sort of start gaining collective knowledge. So this is very important. Um, report transparently. This is a, a biomedical uh, field. We have to take the lessons from the clinical field. Actually, um, the clinical field and the equator network is a very uh, important player in that. In 2010, um, there is this consort statement, which was specific uh, guidelines about reporting um, a randomized clinical trial. And that, which was, which was adopted by all clinical journals, really upped the game in terms of reporting clinical trials in, in, in the clinical uh, literature. And this is really 
um, uh, it was very important. It was adopted by all journals, and it was really the inspiration for um, a lot of the work that I've been involved in at Nature, and, and that many uh, basic science journals are now following in terms of, of really having reporting principles. If you submit to many journals now, you have checklists of things that you need to, to make sure it's reported. Um, it was basically um, uh, several journals started uh, these initiatives independently. They all came together in, in 2014, and um, uh, it was co-organized by Nature Science and the NIH. And we came out uh, at the end of this, this one-day meeting with a list of proposed principles. And it, this is really about reporting guidelines. And these are good. Um, and this is the way that journals can actually influence things and having reporting requirements and, and trying to implement, to really have good compliance to these requirements uh, because that's, that's really basically setting the standard for, for what you can do. So, so reporting requirements is, is really important in the transparency. And, and this is an example from my colleagues at, at Nature's n n neuro, uh, Neuroscience. This is, um, so we started um, then uh, to establish this report, this um, uh, checklist of reporting requirements uh, sometime in early 2013. And this is a comparison. It's a small sample size, so it's, it's, it's quite, you know, take it with a grain of salt. Um, but basically uh, looking at animal experiments um, in nature neuroscience, 10 papers here, 41 paper after, the, so between the two is the uh, uh, inception of these guidelines. Randomization, blinding, and determination of sample size. In green, it's people who report it. In blue, it's not reported. And after uh, the implementation of the guidelines, it red is reported as not done. So what you see really is that these guidelines are not changing the way people do their experiments, at least not yet, and the hope is that eventually it's going to do it. But what you see is at least now you, can, now you know whether it was randomized or not, whether the sample size was um, determined uh, uh, before or not, and this is very important. So I think that, that, that getting to that, that level of compliance is actually very important in how you interpret these, this data. Um, that's another example of something. This is a, a, a small startup. It's not a plug for them, but uh, we're, we're talking uh, um, to them at, at PLOS at the moment. This is completely independent, but this is a group that, um, that uh, it's a database. You have you know, several of these kinds of initiatives. Um, who basically allow you to, to re, uh, register your protocols and you can use them in the lab and all that. And what we're, we're thinking of is, can we as journals really link to that? So we don't link, we don't, we no more would use these kinds of method sections that are written in uh, passive voice usually and very arcanely and it's quite difficult. You have to take your lab notebook, write the method section and then you translate the other way around if you read a paper and it's really, so you know, why not link to the actual protocols that were used in the lab with all the details and how many times it's spent in the centrifuge and, and what was the, the dilution of the antibody, these kinds of things. So, so this, is a, this is an example of how you can start becoming much, much more open about, about the way you do in your science. Um, we talked about the cell lines issue. These are, this is the role that institutions can play, for example. These are two examples of institution, uh, MD Anderson Cancer Center uh, in the US and uh, the GKFZ in, uh, in Heidelberg who have a policy. So these two institutions have a policy about authenticating cell lines. They're providing core facility so you can bring your samples to be analyzed and they have a policy that you have to analyze your, um, your cell lines once a year or twice a year or once every two years, whatever the policy is. But this is a way that institutions can actually drive best practice by providing the infrastructure in the form of a core facility and providing the, the oversight in, a, in, a sen in um, using um, uh, a policy, an internal policy for, for um, an approach. I would, really would love for more um, uh, institutions to do that. Um, in terms of, uh, of what journals can do again, we, um, at PLOS we have a very um, uh, stringent data policy that was introduced in, in 2014. Um, and it's basically requiring authors to, put, to make all the data underlying the paper um, available uh, in their manuscript at submission, at uh, publication, sorry. Obviously there are exceptions for you know, patient data and things like that, things that you can't anonymize. Um, but basically, it's, it's also, um, it, it is a requirement, and it's something we, we are hoping to, to really sort of drive um, uh, this act of sharing uh, by, by making it a requirement. Um, we're requiring people to, to uh, write a data availability statement, which is going to say where the data is and how it can be um, accessed. And, um, you know, it's a policy, but uh, I like to think of it as a program because basically we, we announced this policy one, well, they announced the policy, I wasn't part of this uh, then. Um, 
but what we've seen is that really it needs to it needs a follow up. Ne people need to understand, you know, what 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 is meant really by what's the data underlying the study in a few ways. It sort of depends on the field, and so you have uh, uh, in, in genetics, for example, the the, the editors, um, the all the genetics editors at PLOS have, have come together and decide. Well, this is the kind of thing we mean by the data underlying the um, the paper. And you know, in in 2005, we have about um, we have uh, about 94 percent of the papers that are published in PLOS One that have an, abil uh, an availability statement. Um, this is a, a small sample analysis that people have done before and after, and you see that you know, on this very small number of papers, the needle has moved. We're we're trying to do a more a more um, careful analysis. We know that at least between 20 and, and 30 percent of what was published in 2015. Um, the data is in a repository, so we know it's there. Um, there is uh, a lot of, um, the rest is a bit less clear because we know there are a few exceptions, but also there's a lot of statements that say the, the data is available in the paper. And I must say, at the scale of PLOS One, we don't check on every single paper that that is true. We hope that the reviewers do, but we don't check that that is true. If we're told after publication that the data is not available, we will follow up. We follow up with the authors and we request the data and we try to understand if it's not available, we try to understand why. And sometimes there are legitimate reasons, we need to determine that, but, if, but we are following and we are making people uh, share the data. So, um, so that's, I think, something that, it's a, it's a work in progress, really. Um, but basically, at the journal level, it's a bit late. Right, it's at the time that that we publish the paper. Um, th th is that this is a PhD comics? I love PhD comics. I don't know uh, if you follow it, but it's very good. Uh, does that sound familiar? You know, data underscore twenty ten point zero five twenty eight retest, data twenty ten zero five twenty eight re retest, uh, calibrate. You know, that that if that sounds familiar to any of you, that means you probably need a data management plan. Um, and but that's the, the point. The point is, I mean, this is obviously caricatural. But, but the point is, data management, you don't think about it when you write the paper or when you send the paper to a journal. You need to think of it when you start the experiment. And again, this is a place where the funding agencies have a very strong role to play because they can demand, and some of them do demand, the Wellcome Trust demands a data management plan at the, at, at the time of the grant application. This is where the institutions have a role to play, to provide the infrastructure, the training, to provide, to, to, to do some test of compliance. I mean, this is really something that is, it's more of a systemic problem. So, you know, researchers can do something, but it's usually when you get to that point that you, that you realize you have a problem. And, and so it's about, it's about being very proactive. And, and this is why um, it, it, it demands everybody to, to play together. Um, I'm shifting gears a little bit here, but, but talking about um, uh, these issues of, of, of the publishing system and, and uh, you know, the file drawer problem, the fact that negative results are not uh, published, for example. I mean, this was really the, um, the impetus uh, in, in launching PLOS One. The idea of PLOS One was really a journal in which the papers would be um, vetted only on the basis of the scientific rigor. So there are really rigorous standards. Um, it is peer reviewed uh, for the technical quality, but we, are, we demand that our editors do not make any subjective it, um, um, assessment of impact. So it's really about publishing all science. And as a result, you see a lot of different kinds of papers. There are really boring papers in PLOS One and there, there are really exciting papers in PLOS One. And that's a different way of thinking about journals. But the other thing that is very important, so I mean, yes, I'm making a, pl a plug for PLOS journals, but the thing is that by this definition, it is important that negative findings are welcome. Right? It is, and we're trying, and the interesting thing is that we don't get that many. We don't get that many people publishing their, their, their negative findings. And, and so we've tried to encourage by having a collection where we're really, we encourage, and, and this is sort of pricking along. But it's really not in the, um, it's not in the culture to actually, but, but, in, but if you've done an experiment very well and it didn't give the, the ex it, it's not the basis to continue your, um, your, your research project, it's still important information. And, and being, having a place to, to put that on and having the reflex to think, well, this is a, 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 an amount of work, it needs to be published, I think is very important. So just think about this. Now, 
again, shifting gear a little bit, thinking about um, uh, what needs to change in the system, I think it's very important that we, th we think about credit right, and how we give credit to people. And um, the first thing there, again, this is a plug for ORCID. I don't know, how, how many of you have, have an ORCID? Hmm. Not bad. Um, the other ones, get one. Uh, doesn't cost anything, so it's about 30 seconds. Uh, it's, a, it's, an, it's an open researcher and contributor ID. It's basically, it's the plumbing behind everything. This is not a profile, it's not a social network, it's not a thing, it's the plumbing. It's your unique identifier that will follow you throughout your career if you move institution, if you move, if you change your name, if you get married, if you get divorced, if you do anything, you get, you get this ID. Right, and, and this idea allows you to pull all your contribution from the literature. And, and the idea is really for ORCID to start being in the background of all these systems. In the background, some, some funders are, are requesting uh, ORCID. Now some publishers this year made a, uh, a commitment that we will require, I mean these, this uh, list of publishers, that we will require ORCID at least for corresponding authors. The only reason to start with corresponding authors is that this, this is the person we have this connection with so we can demand it, but we encourage everybody, all the authors on a paper to basically uh, provide their ORCID. And the idea is really that once the ORCID is in the metadata of the paper, with the DOI of the paper, you have that link and you can be followed via, via that link. And so this is very important to start providing a very robust way of crediting all the applications. There are almost two million um, people who have registered an ORCID. Um, and so add to that, first thing you go, if you do one thing after this thing, please go register for an ORCID, it's very, it's very important. And it's in your, in your interest. Um, and, and there are things that are being built on that. So credit is, um, is a, um, it, it was inspired by ORCID. It's basically a very simple taxonomy, 14 terms of the kinds of contribution that go into a research project. And this is, how, this is to illustrate how that system start building. So if every author in a paper has um, an ORCID and has this taxonomy of contribution, right? Wrote the paper, did the experiment, analyzed the data, I mean, all these kinds of information that are associated with that, that becomes machine readable, that becomes portable. You can, you can export it to your profile, you can export it to your CV. It starts saying, what does it mean to be author number six on a 26 author paper, right? What does that mean? And getting away from that, the mud fights that I know that you have to be first, second, third authors, you know, I mean, that <laughs> kind of issue. Le if, if, it if it took 26 people to make this paper, it means these 26 paper people were important. So giving credit to these middle authors is very becoming important. And this is one of the ways to do it. Credit for data, all that kind of thing, you can, you can start getting with this. Um, thinking about citations at the article level not at the journal level, right? I know everybody is obsessed with the impact factor, and it's wrong. You can't judge somebody, and the reason why it's wrong, so this is just the, uh, it's an example on plus, many journals have that, right? The, the number of, of uh, citations, saved users, so these are metrics at the article level. Um, these are very important, and, and, and why are they important? Because this, is a, a deconstructionist blog by Steve Royal at, at the University of, uh, of Warwick in Coventry. Um, and it just looked at um, a number of journals and the distribution of the citation and the, the frequency of these citation in these different journals. So it's a deconstruction of the impact factor. And what you see is that it's a skewed distribution. It's not a normal distribution, right? And, it's not, and the impact factor is an average. This is, this is the, the impact factor of the journal is not a reflection of the, of, the, um, of the value of an individual article within that journal. And so, and this is, I mean, the, you know, there's no, no matter what, he, he did that on a number of journals there. The, the, I can tell you the, 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 the curve for the plus journals is the same one, the curve for the nature journal is the same one. It's really that, that skewed distribution. So it's very important to start thinking at the level of the individual contribution to an article and the value of this article itself and not the impact factor. Um, so that was my pitch about the impact factor, sorry. Um, um, this is another point, accelerating. Because of the impact factor and the fact that we are all, and we've been talking about that yesterday when I was here and talking to many people, this search for an impact factor, it takes a long time to get an article published. And this is not good for research, right? 
um, and this is a, a feature that was in Nature um, uh, just a few weeks ago. Um, the, it paints a very, a, a very complex picture. Um, the production times have gone down over time, which means that the technology of publishers has, done, has gone down, but that has not affected the time to publication. So even though we have slightly better technology, it still takes a huge amount of time to publish a paper. Um, uh, based on the impact factor, it tends to be that the, the small impact factor and the high impact factor journal tend to have the, the, the highest uh, um, time to publication. Um, so it's not really a, a, a direct correlation. Um, and, it's, and, and, you know, and, and, and there is a problem. And so the, the, the complex picture, if you unfold it, it seems to be several things. Once uh, the journals are asking for more and more, reviewers are asking for more, editors are less decisive. And this is an analysis of you know, uh, in the number of figures per paper in 84 and in 2014. Um, and so you see the, 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 the different journals, the increase of that. So the, the drive to more and more data per paper and keeping and adding this, this thing and the editors not being decisive, that leads to these papers waiting a long time, being rejected, being resubmit, resubmitted <coughs> to another journal, usually the one down the line in the impact factor, and, and you go there. And so that leads to this can, this is a survey that they did after on, on the website after, and people have, have, have answered the poll, uh, what's the longest time that you have waited for a research paper to be published? And the, the largest uh, uh, number of response, 37% people said between one and two years. Well, that means one and two years between the time that the research is finished, and you know, granted, it's probably not completely finished, it needs to be improved, and, and the peer review system adds improvement to that, to the time it is published. That's two years. I mean, that's slowing down science, right? It's the time that this information is not getting out. So I think it's really time to start thinking about, about this and start thinking collectively about how we can, we can address that. Um, and it's very timely. I added that in the, in, in, in the talk at the last minute because of this meeting that happened two weeks ago. Uh, on last week, actually, the 17th of February, um, in Bethesda at the HHMI. And it's a number, it was called ASAP Bio. It was organized by Ron Veil and, and Harold Varmus. And it brought together about 70 people, um, ex-NIH directors, um, journal uh, editors, um, uh, scientists, to, um, to discuss the use of preprint servers in the biomedical sciences. So the physics, since 1995, physicians use the archive which is a very bare bone preprint server. You put your PDF there once your research is done. And then you submit to a journal and you continue doing it. And, and that just has the opportunity for this research to be available much earlier to others. And, and you, you, have, you have an opportunity to interact with colleagues much earlier um, uh, in the process. It's not um, you know, sort of hidden in, in, the, in the secrecy of a, of a journal um, uh, evaluation. And there is this thing now called BioArchive that has been uh, launched by Kosting Harbor. There are other ones, other preprint servers starting. This is not the only one. There are several people starting fledging issue. And this is this idea. So it's inspired by the physics. And the question that they asked at that meeting was really, can the biomedical field move to, to that? Because that would help accelerate the communication of research. And it has the potential of changing the whole landscape quite a bit. And it's, it, it's very interesting and very intriguing idea. Um, Several journals already su suggest to do that or support it, so they don't. They won't take it um, uh, as pre-publication. They really the, the poli check the policy of the journals because most do, but some don't. Um, but um, but basically, if you are if you want to submit to, I mean, and I can tell you the plus journals, the Nature journals, all say that uh, preprint servers are fine. They're not considered pre-publication. So um, so that's an important thing. And then there is this communication system, right? PubMed Commons. This is a way where you can actually start commenting on, pa on papers. People told me yesterday you have journal clubs and you discuss here. Well, have you considered putting some of these comments on, on PubMed Commons? Share that knowledge, share the, the, the discussion around the paper and why you know, this paper really didn't use the, the proper control or didn't experiment particularly well. This kind of thing is, is, is becoming important. PubPeer, you might be familiar with it as well, uh, same, same principle, and this is an example where there was a, a, a comment on a PLOS One paper that led to the authors realizing that there was a problem and uh, eventually correcting the paper. So this is, a, this is a, 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 a cycle where we start having, the paper lives after being published, right? There are corrections, there is debate, there are corrections about this. 
The time frame is not ideal. Publish, uh, the paper was published in May. Uh, uh, the comments on, on PubP are, are, are around October, and it, it took until January for a correction. That's not great, but it, it's better than, than, than nothing. So we are, you know, we're trying to really encourage that, that kind of thing. The one thing I'll say, um, and because we are uh, in under the auspices of such a, an important person here, I found this quote um, uh, from Marie Curie saying, there are sadistic scientists who hurry to hunt down errors instead of establishing the truth. So it's a good principle to keep in mind when using these things like Peer. It's not about, it's not a witch hunt. It's not about going after people. And it should be a constructive, this is what, what we're doing as scientists, is ad adding constructive feedback. So. Um, so I'm going to finish really quickly and say, why, why should we do this now? And, and hopefully this is going to give you a little bit of, a, um, of, of an optimistic view on this. Um, but you've all heard about the uh, outbreak of, uh, of the Zika virus um, uh, in, in specifically in Brazil, but now but no, uh, reaching out. Um, in, in the, there was really, it was declared a public health emergency in, early in, in, uh, in December. Um, in uh, early January, the PLOS journals decided that we created a, a, a collection where all the, uh, the, these articles, which are all free to read, everything we had on Zika is, is in one place. People can go. We point to resources from the WHO, et cetera. So it's resources for the, we made a call for paper saying we are prioritizing the review of these papers on Zika virus. Anything that comes in is expedited to peer review. Um, we have a platform called PLOS Currents, which is, for rapid communication, so um, <coughs> experiments in progress, things that are not finished, can actually be submitted. Uh, studies in progress and all that, um, uh, short form, one figure papers, this kind of thing to accelerate that. Um, uh, the Wellcome Trust um, uh, published a statement, got a number of journals together, um, Nature Science, uh, JAMA, uh, New England Journal, PLOS journals, where we all committed to say, Please share your data early. It's not going to be held against you. We actually encourage you to do that before you submit your paper. So this is really a, a reaction to journals to publishing data early in case of public health emergency. And now we've just started as of last week to say to paper, people who submit papers on, on, um, on Zika virus, we're expediting peer review. Please go and post on a preprint server so the information is already uh, available out there. This is a case of emergency. We don't have two years to publish a paper on Zika virus today, right? So we, we need to do better, and this is the reason why. In conclusion, it's a joint responsibility. Um, it's really about researchers, but it's about institutions, it's about journals. I think the journals have the responsibility to establish good reporting requirements and implement them. They have the, the means to give better credit to people and they should implement that. Faster communication and transparent evaluation are very important. I think there is a very important role to play for institutions in training, in providing infrastructure, in, in providing policies. Um, there is really a very important role to play in rewarding people. And if we continue to reward people for publishing in high impact factor journals, that's what's driving the whole system. So there is a very, very important way, uh, a, a very important thinking that needs to happen around how we reward people for rigor, for good laboratory leadership, for professionalism in how we do the research. And for researchers, you have choices. You can choose to be more rigorous. You can choose to be more open. You can choose to share your data, and I would really encourage you to do it. And, uh, and I thank you very much for listening to me.